Bloop a doop a doo. Bloop a doop a da ba boo. Hi, everybody. I'm Michael. I'm Ramin. And we're going to be giving our review of Chrono Trigger. So, this is an obviously well loved game that a lot of people know, but I still am, would like to do this as a spoiler free review. Hopefully you can hear me. So first off, what, what sort of general thoughts do you have about this game? I love this game. It's going to be very hard for me not to be biased in my take on this. It's just such a fundamental part of my adolescence and I've replayed it since then and I'm comfortable saying that even taking nostalgia as a factor, it still holds up. I think that is true for most people when they play this game. Even people who more recently play this game for the first time, people love this game, and for good reason. Chrono Trigger was developed and published by Square in 1995. It was directed by Takashi Tokura, Yoshinori Kitase, and Akihiko Matsui, and produced by Kazuhiko Aoki. This game is sort of unprecedented in how it worked because it brought together people who hadn't worked together before. So we've got Sakaguchi working on this game, but also we have Akira Toriyama, who is most well known known for Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Z, but also had been designing for Dragon Quest for its life so far. Now working with Square on this game. You can really see Toriyama's influence in this artwork. Anybody who's ever watched any of the Dragon Ball series, I think it's immediately apparent. Even when I was, I think I was like 12 or something when I first played this, and I wasn't a big Dragon Ball fan. I had seen a few episodes and I instantly could tell it was his art style. We'll spend more time talking about him when we get to design. I love everything about this story and setting. This game is a perfect example of how your lore doesn't have to be complicated, it just has to be detailed. There isn't even a lot of detail in this. There are plenty of unanswered questions about the lore, but it gives you enough information that it's really clear what's going on. And I also think it handles time travel better than any game I've ever played to this day. Honestly, I tend to not like time travel in general in storytelling. Time travel in storytelling usually creates more questions than the writers are able to answer. But I think this game kind of nails it. I think it's just right. The pacing, I think, is perfect. You spend just enough time in each setting to get a feel for what's happening, but not so much time that you're getting bored or it feels tedious. When it comes to the world, what I think is really interesting is that within each time period, the world is actually quite small, but you get to explore it several times through each time period. And it's fun to see what stays the same and what changes in the world and what your actions have an effect on in the world. Like there's a desert here in one time period, but if you go back and help someone build a forest, then there's a forest there in a later time period. It also strikes a really perfect balance between dark and comic. There are comic moments to fill in the in-between of these really dark story beats, but the dark story beats feel especially bleak which is really appropriate for the conflict that this game sets up. But the pacing is great because it gives you enough that you're constantly wondering how to fix all the awfulness. <laughs> Looking at the heroes first, we basically agreed on everything. This is a very strong cast. The weakest link in the cast of heroes is just fine, and that's Chrono. I understand why a silent protagonist is necessary in a lot of games. I just, it's never interesting or fun to me. Yeah, I think it's intended to allow you to easily fill yourself into that role, but I don't think it's necessary in a game like this, where at least for me, the main conflict is so engaging that I don't need to feel like I'm a character in it to feel like I'm part of it, but I love all the characters in this. I really love that the female characters, for the most part, at least among the main playable cast, defy a lot of tropes about female characters that were common in this day and age and could persist to this day. The only one who could really be conceived as ever being a damsel in distress is Maro, and for the most part she defies that role when it's pinned on her, and Luca defies so much of the female stereotypes, as does Isla, really, even yeah. though Isla's design isn't my favorite, which we're getting to later. Right. And I think one interesting thing about Chrono as 
silent protagonist is that the game actually proves at one point that you don't need him as the silent protagonist. I'm not going to talk about how or why, but it's one of the most interesting twists of the game. Moving along with that, I like that many of the conflicts this game puts forth for you to resolve can be resolved in multiple ways, which you really can't say about most RPGs in this era. Most RPGs are very linear in the early to mid 90s. Even by the time you can explore the world, there's one way to solve most problems in most RPGs. And that is not the case here. I think the villains in this game are really interesting. And I like how they have differing levels of villains who are especially competent and villains who are very much not. But even if a villain is incompetent, that doesn't mean that they're not a threat. The only villains I didn't give a five in this category, and this goes for many of the categories I rated, the only only times I didn't give characters a five were times when the characters just weren't as developed as the others, which I think it's important to note is usually a necessary evil in storytelling. The only times I can think of when I've even heard of every character getting equal development are like Tolstoy novels, and right. that's really not a fair comparison. But I love Lavos. I like when a villain is just kind of this great big evil force that isn't humanized. I also like when a villain is humanized, but I think sometimes some media goes too far in humanizing villains to the point where it's like, well, why should I root for anyone to take this person down anymore? And the central conflict in the narrative gets lost because of that. I like Magus a lot as a villain, especially when you learn more about his backstory later, and I don't want to give anything away. Right. And I think Magus is interesting in that he is the villain that is more humanized. And also, similarly, one of the non-human villains is more humanized. Azala, I think, is a really strong character. Yes. I love Azala, and I love that both of them and Queen Zeal, really most of the human villains, most of the non-Lavos villains, have reasons for their villainy that the player can potentially empathize with, but the game still makes it clear that it's not forgivable what mm -hmm. they're doing, which is a balance that many games, even to this day, struggle to find. Mm -hmm. And then we've also got the Prophet, but we can't really talk about the Prophet very much at all. But yeah, very interesting character. Right, like what I love about this game villains is that most of the important questions you have about them are answered at some point in the narrative. Mm -hmm. And those that aren't answered are often addressed in Chrono Cross, which is the <laughs> sequel, which maybe one day we'll talk about. I don't know. <laughs> NPCs are weaker, but that's okay. So like what I've noted in a lot of games is that there usually is sort of a give and take on which of these three categories a game does really strongly. And often when there's one or two weaker of categories of characters, the ones that are not weaker are significantly stronger to make up for that. So, for example, in Final Fantasy 3, the heroes are very weak, but the important NPCs are so interesting, and that sort of makes up for it, and they are the important characters in the game. In Chrono Trigger, I feel like the NPCs are, you know, maybe a little bit weaker, but overall, they're still pretty strong. I agree that the NPCs are weaker, but I like that most of them have some kind of conflict that is really directly tied to the narrative and again the major why questions for these NPCs are answered at some point in the narrative like the the three elders the the wise men the, the wise men whatever you know magi I think the game might even call them magi no not in this translation okay. at least they okay. might in another but even they like they're probably some of the least explored NPCs but when you learn about the backstory of the game and their past and what they had to endure you really feel for them or or some of the future NPCs are the same way <laughs> Even if I can't list more than maybe two personality traits for them, I still feel for them, which I think is the most important thing for a character. And some of them, even when they are very small characters in the story, like Cyrus, can actually have a lot of depth behind them in that small time that we see them. Right. And Cyrus and also Shala and some others are examples of the great balance this game strikes in between mystery and clarity. <laughs> There's just enough information given about them that I want more yeah. without me feeling dissatisfied or like the game was incomplete somehow. Right. When we get to things like diversity and gender balance, it's basically just par for the course in this game. This is what is to be expected from other JRPGs around this time. And that's not to say it's like great. 
it's not good, but it's expected. All of the human characters in this game present as the same race. As for gender balance, depending on how things go, it could be 50-50, men versus women in your final party of heroes. If you look at all of the characters that have names and that are somewhat important throughout the game, only eight of the 30 that I thought were most important are anything other than cis male characters. I also feel that's a bit of a problem, but I think that this game does deserve just a, a little gold star for the fact that the female portrayals are so nuanced and unique. I mean, the, the princess is rebellious, but not really to the point that it doesn't feel rational anymore. There are lots of examples of princesses that are rebellious where it's like, come on, to go on a tangent here. I love Aladdin, it's my favorite Disney movie, but some of the stuff Jasmine gets away with, like, come on. But Nadia, I don't know, somehow feels a little, it feels a little bit more realistic. And I love that there are female characters with the gamut of traits outside of just femininity and sexuality. Isla, for example, even though I don't love her design, it doesn't feel super sexualized because she's just, you know, because of the era she's from. I love that Luca is a smart female character who still has a lot of heart. There are many games where we give the female these personality traits, but we kind of take her heart away or we take her sensitivity away. Examples aren't coming to mind at the moment. I also think, I don't know where to put this idea. Diversity feels like the best place, but it might not be because I don't want to invite any unsavory comparisons, but I do like in this game how the issue of a race of monsters is portrayed and eventually resolved. It's hard to talk about this without giving spoilers away, and again, it's hard to talk about this without giving unsavory comparisons right. to real world issues, but it is very often in games of all media where a, a monstrous race is just like bad and, and just black and white bad and you are good. And it feels very colonizing, very imperialistic. And it seems like this game is gonna play it that way at first, but give it a shot is, that's all I'm gonna say. Actually, it does it twice with the reptites and the mystics. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and. It's cool too that there are two races like that and that there is a little bit of nuance in how they're treated differently mm -hmm. and, and how their fates end up different yes. from each other. And a little bit more on gender. You were talking about Nadia, but it's also interesting that there are two other female characters who are, well, there are actually more than two more, but there are two more important female characters who are of the ruling class in Queen Zeal and Shala and they are all so different from each other. The closest pair of them are Nadia and Shala, but that's tenuous, really. It's just they're both princesses, and they both want to do something other than is expected of them, but they go about that in very different ways. I think this game is still pretty in 2023. Really, ever since it came out, there's been rumor after rumor about a remaster. I don't need a remaster. I think this game is fine as it is. I am fine with Square Enix making all their money off of re-releasing it for Steam and all these other platforms. Go to town. But I don't need a re-release of this game. Yeah. I, I think that voice acting might even do more harm than good. And I have to say, maybe it's the fact that I'm having a cocktail, but I'm getting a little emotional even talking about <laughs> this game. Uh, because I think part of the charm of it is how easily you can place yourself in this setting, even ignoring the silent protagonist. Mm -hmm. And I think that some of that would be lost if you made it a, a big, sexy remaster with the updated graphics and the voice acting and all that stuff. Right. I think that that serves some games better than others. I don't think it would serve this. Yeah. And specifically with graphics, I think games that are intentionally going for a cartoonier style like this age way better than games that are trying to be realistic. We keep seeing that throughout all of video game history. The games that have realistic graphics look great at the time, but then a couple years later, once graphics have moved past that, they look bad. But the games that are intentionally being lighter with it, being cartoony or being more fanciful with it, hold up way better. In this era, there are two major styles of sprite. The one is the like, maybe someone knows the terms better than I do, and if you do, please comment in our comment section. But there is the sprite that like would fit in a square box, like 
Final Fantasy V, yeah. those sprites, in the original, I mean. And then there's the sprites, like in this game, that are the more like the rectangular, you know, the tall, thin sprites. This is the only game I've played where I liked how the tall, thin sprites looked. Mm -hmm. I've never liked it in any other game, but I think these sprites are really beautiful. Yeah, this really is kind of the pinnacle of what sprite work on the Super Nintendo looks like. Okay, I would say that the Breath of Fire games are right up there neck and neck, if not even slightly better, but this is basically at about the pinnacle. We can bring in Toriyama a little bit more specifically. So let's just jump right into the character designs. Are there any that stick out to you as especially good or especially bad? I really like Chrono's design. I like that he's a warrior, but he's not immediately muscle bound. I think also that he and many of the other characters, even though they are recognizably Toriyama's style, many of these characters don't feel like they would fit in Dragon Ball Z, which I enjoy. I disagree, actually. Oh. I think you could take any character from Dragon Ball Z or or Dragon Quest or Chrono Trigger and move them around and they would still look fine. And I was just talking with an artist friend about this earlier today. I don't think that's a bad thing. Toriyama's style is very distinguishable and you can always tell that it's him and that's not a bad thing. There are times when his style works better than others, but like you could take the protagonist of Dragon Quest XI and swap him with Chrono. It's true. It would be the same. I agree more about Dragon Quest than I do about Dragon Ball Z. Getting into specifics here, I like Chrono's design. I like Luca's design. I really love Marl's design. It's understated, but I like that she's a princess who... That's not a spoiler, right? You find out. Okay. Yeah. What is a spoiler and isn't a spoiler, internet? <laughs> Let us know in the comments below. I like that... She is a princess, but her outfit feels feminine, but not frilly and functional. Mm -hmm. I think this is a good lesson for other designers too, that functional from a, for a female character doesn't always have to mean every inch of her flesh is covered up. It doesn't always have to mean she's wearing armor, but like that her outfit looks like something that I think some of my female friends might want to wear. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Her outfit feels comfortable and cute, but not designed strictly for the male gaze. One of the only characters that I've gave a low score to is Toma, and he's such a small character. I wish he were a larger character because I think he's interesting, but he's in so little of the game that his design doesn't bother me that it's not my favorite. Many of the non-central named characters, their designs get kind of generic. To me, the three wise men feel that way. Mm. I actually really like how there's something interesting about them. Like when you first see Melchior at the beginning of the game, he's not telling you that he's anything other than just a salesperson, uh, just a, you know, traveling weapons guy. But there's something about his sprite that makes you sort of perk. I'm like, oh, this guy, there's something different about this guy. There's something interesting about him. And you eventually learn that, yes, there is something interesting about him. But it's not to the point that he looks like one of the main cast or one of the main villains. I think the design for the three wise men is actually great. I also, because I mentioned it before, I thought I would circle back to a Isla's, Isla, Isla, Isla. I thought I would circle back to Isla's design because I think there are worse female character designs out there, but there are better ones too. For the era that she's from, I get what they were going for, but if I think it through in my head of like, okay, I'm a female Neanderthal, I don't know if that's the word to use here, but would I really go to the trouble of cutting that top so my midriff is bare? when most of the other villagers are just in, you know, like the draped yeah. leotard type of thing. And again, there are worse examples of male gaze out there, but it does kind of feel like... Mm. Yeah. And as Molly pointed out in a very old video where we made her look at female JRPG character design, I'll link it somewhere. Isla somehow was able to perm her hair or you know, blow dry curls into it. Cause like, that's not right. What, that's not what your, anyone's natural right. hair will do. Right, like straight guys, it might seem sexy to have that cave woman girlfriend, but in real life, she probably would have been a little janky. <laughs> yeah. I really like that Azala, her character design is female present, right. what? Azala, the leader of the reptites? Yeah. I like that her character design is female presenting, but not like weirdly sexual. And also she still feels like a lizard lady. <laughs> I don't know how to put it. Maybe what I'm talking about is more her personality. I have never read Azala as female at all. 
Really? For a Google search later. Yeah, interesting. That's cool, though. <laughs> Azala is specific in character, but non-specific enough in design that you can read what you want. Which sort of makes sense for a species that's so different from humans. Yes. So other things that are designed other than the characters, towns, dungeons, monsters, and transportation. The one thing I will say is that because of the way this game works, you don't walk into a town. You walk into each of the individual homes and shops of the town from the world map, which is an interesting way to do it. Can be a little frustrating sometimes when you like miss that, oh, I could actually walk into that side of the building and get a different building. But because of that, the towns all basically feel identical. Like they're all the same thing because you're only looking at individual houses. The design of all of the buildings look different depending on which time period you're in. But other than that, within a time period, every space is basically identical. But it's not enough of a problem for me to give it a low score, it's just a mess score. Yeah, I agree. I enjoy the dungeon design in this. I think there are some interesting puzzles, such as the water cave you're in at that one point. But there are also a few dungeons that feel like they go on a little too long. And I also enjoy the monster designs, actually. I think that for the level of graphic capabilities they had at the time, there are some truly terrifying monster designs in this. In fact, it reminds me of many of the monsters in Final Fantasy VI, yeah. actually. Like that kind of grotesque, overwrought, uh, asymmetrical aesthetic. But also, there are monsters in this that are the typical Toriyama sort of thing that, like, it's a monster, but it's cute. Like, the Dragon Quest slimes are cute. And there are early monsters in the game that are actually pretty cute <laughs> in Chrono Trigger as well. Side note for later, I thought you were going to say Tori Amos when you said Toriyama <laughs> and then an S word. Now I want a Chrono Trigger where all the monsters have Tori Amos's head superimposed. <laughs> so the transportation in Chrono Trigger is interesting in that there's only... Okay, there are two few... No, okay, three. But two of them you don't control yourself. There's the fairies in the in the present day. There's the blackbird, which you don't control at all. Right. And there's epoch or epoch or however you pronounce it. Oh, wait, there's also the speed bike, but we'll get to that in a minute. But yeah, transportation is not hugely important in this game, partially because the world map is actually so small. Basically, there are just like a couple islands that are isolated that you have to wait until you get wings to be able to reach them. I do think there could be more transportation variety, but what is there I enjoy. I enjoy flying around in the epoch and changing the time period. I don't know why. Maybe it's the nostalgia factor for me, but it just feels fun. And it also, because the world is so small, it doesn't feel like too much of a slog. I know you were saying earlier it could have been faster, and I agree, but it doesn't feel like too much of a slog to get anywhere. If the world were at the size of some Final Fantasy maps, I might feel differently. Yeah. As we talked about in the video with Molly that has already been on the channel, but has not been recorded yet at the time recording this, the music in this game is excellent, but to me, it doesn't do as much of the heavy lifting in the storytelling as it does in most Final Fantasy games, which is not a problem, I just think that's an interesting thing to point out. For instance, in Final Fantasy VI, every character in your party has a different theme that is associated with them. Okay, there's a slight exception to that. But in Chrono Trigger, only three of your six players Playable characters has a theme. Which three? Robo, Frog, Isla. Those were not the three I would have guessed. Yeah, much of the music in this game does a better job of explaining the setting, but there are some cases that it even doesn't really do that. Like the world map themes, though I think they're all excellent compositions, for the present day and the medieval period, they don't really tell you much about the setting. Which is, again, not a problem, it's just an interesting thing, I think, to point out. I think this soundtrack is as close to perfect as video game soundtracks go. I agree with your points, but I think that the narrative of this game stands alone enough that the music doesn't really need to help. There are so many tracks that stand alone that I could listen to outside of the game, and since the game was released, many reorchestrated versions have shown up online, or even Square Enix has published some, and those are fine and I like them too, but I can listen to the MIDI as well. It's one of the few instances where the MIDI versus the orchestration really makes no difference for me as long as the sound is well balanced. I love this soundtrack. I, I just, I, I, I could gush about this game all day. Yeah. I gave Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI both like perfect scores on sound across the board. But if I had to pit them against each other, I would pick Final Fantasy VI just because of how it tells the story itself along with the dialogue. But they both still get perfect marks for me. 
This is a fun game. Moving around on the map, on the world map, and in towns and dungeons never really feels like a slog. I enjoy the combat, and I really love the tech combinations. Like, you can combine characters' abilities, essentially. And you can't do it perfectly with every single character, but most combinations you can imagine work. It's hard for me to think of another game that does that well. Persona 5 kind of comes to mind, but it's really not the same in the way that it works. The Fantasy Star games do it, and it's interesting with Fantasy Star because you can't pick the combined skill. You just have the two characters do their same skills, and it might trigger the combined skill, which I think is interesting in a different way. It can be frustrating to play it that way, but I'm like, I really want this to happen, and I'm putting them in this order for that to happen, and if it doesn't happen, it's really frustrating but then if it does, it's like, yes, I got it, <laughs> you know? I think that's just sort of a different way of doing it, but I think it's also interesting. Yeah, and I like that this game's design of combat is simple. It's a great example of how you don't need many interwoven mechanics or complicated mechanics to make combat feel varied. It's a testament to this game that just about any party composition you can think of will work, as long as you brought at least one healer, and there are at least three healers. I can't really think of another game game with a cast this small that does that. Yeah, the battles are snappy. They don't st overstay their welcome. Even like some of the tougher boss battles or the more tedious boss battles. We just beat the game last night and there was one boss battle that we did that I found tedious, but it was still quite fast compared to a lot of boss battles in RPGs. The only place I can sort of ding this game is for my taste. There are a few too many encounters, but I like that you can always see the encounters not always, no. almost all of the time, you can see the encounter before it happens. And you know, we were talking last night about how the game was marketed to say, you can avoid the encounter if you want, and that's not as true as they advertise it to be. But what you can do is heal between encounters and yeah. prepare yourself and even change party in, in many cases between encounters. Yeah, that's sort of an interesting point. I really like how the battles take place on the map screen. You don't go to a different battle arena mm -hmm. for them. And I like how often you can see there's a monster there. If I run into it, I'll start a battle. But I think there are too many cases where you just take a couple steps and there's some monster that you didn't see that pops out at you, which makes sense storytelling wise, but it sort of undercuts a little bit of the cool thing that they were doing with making enemies show up on the field. I also think something worth noting is that there aren't loading screens for each combat, which really slog some games down, especially games that came later than this, yeah, that were sort of, yeah, in between the era where we are now and where we were then, where like they were trying to do these really amazing graphical things. One game that comes to my mind is Lost Odyssey, which the loading screen is so long. Like, I think I counted it once. It's legitimately 15 seconds you are waiting from the time that the battle music cues and you realize you're in an encounter to the time when you can actually control your characters. Mm -hmm. And they try to dress it up by like orchestrating it with some sweeping strings and different camera angles, and it doesn't make it any better. Yeah. <laughs> but it, I think it helps this game that there aren't those loading screens and that you can like you say, that you don't go to a separate map to keep the flow moving. There really isn't ever a time in this game where I feel like I can drop the controller and just chill and wait and like go do something else. Right. Unless I want to, unless I pause it. Right. I want to kind of bring a couple of these points together with grinding, learning curve, and difficulty. I think this game has just about the perfect difficulty. I tend to like games on the easier side. If you're having a trouble with something, you can always go grind and I will do that. But also, since the battles are so snappy, I don't mind grinding in this game. But what this game and other games like it do, and it's always great when they do it, is they've got a New Game Plus. New Game Plus allows you to start the game over with the stats that you had on that save slot when you were last playing the game. So that makes it really fun for a quick casual playthrough. The game is listed on how long to beat as between 20 and 25 hours. I beat it in like 10, 15, somewhere around there, just because I didn't have to grind at all and all the battles went extra fast because I was so overpowered. But the story is still so good that it doesn't feel like I'm just not doing anything. Like I'm still engaged with it the whole time. And the best part is there are certain secret challenges that are still applicable to a new game plus. Mm -hmm. 
talking much more about them would be a huge spoiler, but essentially there are multiple endings, and to unlock some of them, you kind of have to do a new game plus. And again, it's hard for me to think of games even to the modern day where that's how New Game Plus can function. Most games, New Game Plus is, as you're sort of alluding to, just easy mode, which is fine, but it's, again, really a testament to the genius of this game's design that there's that level of versatility yeah. baked into it. Yeah, that basically just leaves mini games. So mini games are often the worst part of a JRPG. They're not bad in this game. You are forced to play a couple. Basically, you have to, there's a fair at the beginning of the game. At some point late in the game, you have to get enough points at the fair to do something. But even that is actually optional, because you can beat the game without doing that. But most people will have to play enough of the games to get enough points to do something. But, you know, you could pick the game that takes two seconds to get a point and just do that really quickly and it's great. You don't have to do the ones that actually take a little bit of work to get there. There's another mini game that is technically optional, but I think a lot of people don't realize that it's optional, the speed bike race, which I actually find kind of strangely frustrating. Um, oh yeah. yeah. But you don't have to do it. You could skip it and just fight more enemies instead by walking through a dungeon, but you could totally skip that minigame if you don't want to do it. I didn't love the minigames, but to your point, there are way more frustrating minigames out there, and there are plenty of options, which I think is a great summary for this review and for this game, just how many options there are and how, even though the story is relatively simple, there's so much versatility in how you approach it. So I gave this game a 98 out of 100. Just to spite you, I gave it a 99. But I also gave it a 99 because I just, I think this game is as close to perfect as a game from that era can get for an RPG. And the funny thing is, I have replayed other games more than this game. There are other games I would call my favorite over this game, but uh, it's just so good. This is only the second time that Ramin and I have reviewed a game together, and he's given a higher score than I have, so this means something. The other one was Earthbound, where he also gave one point higher than me. <laughs> <laughs> the formula gave this game a 98%, so when you average that 98 with my 98 and Ramin's 99, this game gets a 98%, which I think is right. Yeah. I hope none of you were triggered by the fact that we are not going in chronological order. What would that even be in this review? Because it's a 95 game, and even though you're releasing it, they, they don't know that we're recording in a different... Oh, okay. I tried, okay? <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. Be sure to like this video if you liked it. Give it a pity like if you didn't like it. If you have any other thoughts that we didn't share about this game, please let us know in the comments below. I love reading your thoughts and having conversations with you. To, let me think about this. To this side, yeah, that's correct. On this side is a video that YouTube thinks you'll like, so give that a watch if you're interested. Up there is the button that you can click to subscribe to our channel. We put out reviews of mostly video games and music, but we talk about TV and movies a little bit too. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed this. Let us know how we did. Maintain your groovy selves. See y'all next time. Ah!